Everybody knows that the pro-global warming crowd are using statistics from five years ago because the curve has gone back to global cooling or cooling down again because it's always cyclical and it's all, and it's all coming around again uh, over the history of the planet. So there is no such thing as global warming. And, you know, in the 70s it was global cooling. Another ice age was coming. We're all going to freeze it down. In the 80s we couldn't use hairspray because of the aerosol was going to blow out the whole ozone. And now we're down to global warming. What's next, Joe? <laughs> Uh, you think the internet, Joe, you think the internet needs regulation? Do you think the federal government has a role to play in that? Um, I do believe that you're going to go with me again. Um, That's why we I, have him here. I, no, no, I don't know about... Joe's a good sport. I, I came here as a good sport. You guys, I will be available to speak to any of you outside after. You can come, you can talk to me. I have no problem whatsoever, basically. So your question is, do I think... I, I do not think that media needs more regulation. However, <laughs> this woman right there was like, she was going like this. <laughs> but it's an area, it's a, I, I have to say it's an area that I am not as well versed in as I would like to be. I think that as long as we can get the internet to as many people as possible is really where the economy is going, both in the United States and around the world. And uh, I think that's the important issue for me. But it was one I will have to admit that I have to be more uh, opened up on and learn more about. So I turn to Michael, if you're the expert in that area. Um, not to say I'm an expert, uh, but internet regulation means two things: two things: further loss of liberty and more taxes. And that's all the liberals want. And the liberals who want regulation on the internet to keep conservatives from getting their message out have no problem letting pedophiles and sex offenders on the internet and not restrict their access. There's a lot of, uh, with the health care bill that has passed, uh, is there anything in that bill that you see as a positive step at all? Anything that's in there or anything that, any kind of reforms that you feel that need to be addressed? Let me level? talk about the health care bill on, on a personal level. I don't know we were going to talk about this. Many people know me and know that I have a five-year-old son who has an incurable brain condition called hydrocephalus. And everybody knows that has, that has these kind of conditions, that this is the best country to treat those kind of conditions. And when we deal with families all across the country and the world, kids from Canada come to this country for the treatment because there is no cure for hydrocephalus. Where is my son going to go now when he has to wait six months for a CAT scan or eight months for another shunt replacement? So there is nothing good out of the health care bill. There's less tort reform when we need more, and there's more regulations when we need less. Blessing that your son has both you and your wife to be with Thank you. you. Make sure that that. Uh, so certainly, the most important thing in that family unit is the you know the support that you can provide for him in that way. So you get a hand on that because that's certainly something that other people don't necessarily take on. Um, I am a you're going to boo again. I am a single payer guy. That was good enough. Now, the problem that I have with this bill, again, is from the other side, is that I don't think it goes far enough. I think that we do, we do, have, we do have the best medical delivery system in the world, and I am of the opinion that it should be delivered to every American, period, in some fashion, where they can get... Let him finish. Let him finish, please. It should be delivered to every American right now. It is delivered. Please let him finish. Oh, come on. It is delivered by federal law in ways that are. It is delivered by federal law. Can I take the camera off her letter? Let it sound like a whip. Please, everybody, let Joe finish. Thank you. No, 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 I don't mind. Let him speak. So I'll finish because we've got to wrap up here a little bit. Okay, I'm going to take a break. So, I, in, my, in, my, in my feeling, Please, man. in my feeling that we have the best medical delivery system in the world, I'm of the opinion that that system should be able to be delivered to every, every American to get health care. I mean, that's my, that's my, which, which, that is my, which, which, which already exists. I, I want to, and, but it's delivered, this is what I'm going to say before I interrupt you, is if it's delivered through emergency room, 
that is, and more conservatives, well, that is the most expensive way to get to people, to the and I think our emergency rooms are already overburdened, and basically, to deliver, to to please, to please to deliver health care in the most expensive way is not something that I think conservatives would want to do. Right. Right. So, let me go back to how it sounds. I made a mistake when I said uh, more toward from what I meant. There's more opportunities for higher litigation and more payouts, which is going to end up costing us more money in the in the long run. The health care issue doesn't need to be. Uh, it needs to be reformed, tweaked, not reformed and gutted. What needs to be re gutted is COA, and that's another issue. But uh, the health care debate is not about t cutting it and giving uh, health care to illegal immigrants, which is what this bill does. All right. Now, I'm just ready to kind of wrap it up. So I'm just going to have, uh, I'm going to have like one question for both of you guys, kind of a closing statement. And we'll start with Joe, because then it might have the final word. And, and Joe, um, uh, what do you see as the role of government in about a minute, in about a minute to describe yeah. what's the, how government can uh, be? I think government gets involved in people's lives when, and when the marketplace fails. If the marketplace fails, and that's a game changer for many people, that's when the government is coming in. Uh, Medicare became the law of the land in the 1960s because older people were losing their houses, were dying off. Today, because of Medicare, number one, the poverty rate among senior citizens has been cut in half. Number two, people have been able to hold on to their homes and have dignity as they get older. That's what I'd like to see with the health care system reformed from the government. Again, I didn't think you'd agree with me, but that's my feeling. I don't think there's one person here over 65 that would be willing to give up their Medicare if they're on Medicare right now, because it's a program that essentially has to have So that's my minute. Michael, no. This is an easy question for a conservative to answer in under a minute, where a liberal needs about 10 minutes to go for all the things that the government needs to do for them. But the quick answer is, is what Grover Norquist said it best in his book, leave us alone. Keep your hands out of our pockets, all my guns, and out of my house. And that's the answer. If it's not in the Constitution, it can't, the government shouldn't be able to do it. Provide national security, protect our borders, and protect the life of the unborn, and then get out of everything out of my way for everything else. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Joe. Uh, You know, just before we all break for lunch, uh, Phil Kirpin's here, and I know you all heard him a few minutes ago, and I want to thank these two guys, especially Joe, who's a good sport for being here tonight. I just want to say, I want to thank you all, so even the people who shout it out and try to shout me down, um, we live in the greatest country ever on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and all things are ahead of us, and I truly believe that those of you who shout it out comes from a very passionate place on these issues, which we all feel. And this is why uh, we do what we do, and this is why we can get along. I like Mike very much. I'm a great good friend. I just met Rick for the first time. And I hope to meet some of all of you. Uh, America, God bless America. I say the word God, God bless America. I thank you all for inviting me. And uh, I am the last thing between, you can tell everybody, that the last thing between you and lunch at a &P conference was a liberal democrat. <laughs> Yeah, handshake for the thought, so. uh, But I was just talking about Phil Kirkman very quickly. You guys should know this about Phil because it hasn't been discussed. Phil, uh, you all have heard of the Stupak Amendment. And uh, in December, when the Stupak Amendment was being voted on, I was down at Grover Norquist meeting in Washington. And everyone's like, this is great. The Democrats are split. We're going to we're gonna beat them on this. And Kirkman was the only guy out there who said, this is a horrible idea. I can't believe we're letting them do this. Because once they vote yes, they will vote yes again. And everybody was like, no, Phil. You don't understand. You're wrong. Let me tell you something. If people in Washington had listened to Phil Kirkman, we would not have Obamacare. So when you guys all you see Phil out there today, want everybody to shake his hand and say, hey, thanks, Phil. Next time, maybe we'll listen to you. Maybe the government will listen to you. Maybe the Republican Party will listen to you. Steve? Thank you, Rich. Again, Joe, thank you with Mike. That was terrific. Folks, lunch is downstairs in the city grill from uh, 12... Who the hell do you think you are? Uh, move a little bit to, to, to the right. <laughs>